Hello, today's uh, February 13th, 2024. I'm Randy Bach, um, and I'm honored to have with me uh, Michael and Thomas Pack, or in this case, Thomas and Michael Pack. Mm -hmm. And um, Michael, I remember from a thousand years ago, uh, we went to uh, Horace Mann School in the Bronx, and uh, he was friends with my older brother, and uh, he is uh, a filmmaker, and um, how would you call it? I guess uh, he's um, kind of an iconic uh, message maker. Um, I, I loved his film um, uh, on Clarence Thomas. I think it's created equal, if I'm not mistaken. And um, and uh, he and Thomas are engaged in in bringing uh, other films to to be. And so, uh, without further ado, uh, Michael Thomas, uh, tell us a little about yourself, your project, and what is uh, Palladium Pictures, if I'm not mistaken, and so forth. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having us on your your podcast. Um, and it's good to see you again after all these years. We won't give the number. Um, so yeah, I, I have been making documentaries for many years. I've done 15. They've all been nationally broadcast on PBS. As you said, the last one was about Clarence Thomas, Created Equal, Clarence Thomas in his own words. Still available streaming on, on Amazon and Newsmax and Fox Nation and many other places. And go to our website and find it. Um, but after doing this for many years, um, we have just we are now trying to expand and and deal with what we think is a major problem that that there is really a dearth of talent, creative talent on the right period, but it, particularly in our area of documentary films. You know, this has been this last decade or so has ha seen an explosion of nonfiction and documentary films. Period. You know, it's on the left, really. So you see more and more of those kinds of films on Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and PBS uh, and HBO and everywhere, you know, from true crime to political things to whatever. And, they're, and the quality has gone up and up and up. I mean, often they're indistinguishable in a way from scripted drama. And they, on the other hand, it has only been on one side. They're all progressive films. So why is that? I mean, and, and how do and how can we fix it? Clearly, the country is not benefited by hearing only one side of many issues. So, our analysis really is that it is that it began years ago. That the left, starting in the 1960s, having failed to create you know violent Marxist revolution in America, announced to the world that they were going to engage in a long march for the institutions and try to infiltrate if that's maybe too strong a word, the cultural institutions of America, starting at the universities, where many of them were, and extending to Hollywood and the media and everywhere else. I mean, I think it's their right to do that. I, I don't hold it against them. They said they were going to do it. They did it. They've been very successful. These, 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 all these institutions are dominated by progressives. And in an, and they have made films and and, and and exercise their power in an open and fair way, as is appropriate in a democracy. We have failed to, 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 to mirror it. And they have, over these years, since the 60s, spent, I say, tens of billions of dollars on nonfiction programming alone. And, you know, and it, way more, really. You know, the, for example, Netflix spends, I think, eight something, eight point something billion a year. So maybe half of that are nonfiction or less. And, Public broadcasting is 2.5 billion, and Ford and MacArthur, they have, you know, you you can quickly get to 10. On the right side of the spectrum, it's more like tens of millions. It's not nothing. And I, myself, and my company have been beneficiaries of that. But tens of millions compared to tens of billions is a thousand times less over decades. So it's created a, an ecosystem on the left and nothing on the right. So the people on the left have built structures to, to nurture and encourage filmmakers, as it is their right to do so, beginning in colleges and universities. There are 4,000 universities in America. Everyone has a film school. They are consciously progressive and woke. They often advertise that they're going to create you know, advocates for, for social justice. And so every year they graduate, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of wannabe filmmakers. So only five or ten percent have talent, and they and then go on to be successful. And there's no sifting, similar sifting process on the right. And then it goes on from there. Those young filmmakers can get grants from 
left of center foundations like Ford and MacArthur. They can get their films aired on PBS and, and, and Netflix. They can go to friendly production companies that, that are looking for young filmmakers. Their films are then shown at film festivals that look for those kinds of films from Sundance and Telluride and Toronto on down. And where is the system on the, on the right? There is nothing. So, so the net result is all the talent, all the production, all the output is on the left. And you, America is only getting one side of important subjects. And it's often not apparent because it, it's not so much the bias of the films as the stories they choose to tell. Uh, I said that we, as, as, as Randy said, we made a documentary about Clarence Thomas. Before then, the most popular Supreme Court documentary was about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's a different choice of whose story to tell. Of course, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had two documentaries and a feature yeah. film and many other things, Clarence Thomas said, only us. But, but still, our story got out there on PBS and, and other, and other and, and in movie theaters and streaming. And our goal is to create a new talent pool and a new ecosystem that's libertarian, right of center, maybe just unwoke. And because this is such a difficult task, I don't want to do it. So I handed it over to my son, <laughs> Thomas, to actually succeed in doing it. So Thomas, how are you doing that? That's right. I mean, I, I mean, I just to highlight the sort of two sides of what you're saying here. I mean, uh, the, the one thing I think we sort of are screaming on the mountaintops is this, you know, that the culture matters and that it's currently it's a it's a field that we're barely playing in on, on the right. Um, and I think that this the good thing about this point is it is sort of immediately obvious to a lot of people that, that we once we say it, um, you know, I mean, I always point to, you know, the way abortion is portrayed in film. Um, you know, over time and that how that affected the way we think about it. Uh, you know, the other obvious one is, you know, you know, the impact that Will and Grace had on, you know, how we see, you know, gay relationships. I mean, whatever side of it you're on, it clearly moved the needle on the culture. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, there's no reason not to be doing this. It, it makes, you know, dollar for dollar that the impact of that you know, was way more effective than any sort of political campaigns that conservative, you know, social groups put into place. So I do think people care about th this sort of culture point. And I think that there is going to be, you know, the normal conservative response is always, okay, well, let's just buy a streaming service and then make conservative movies. Like, let's fix it. Uh, and I think that'll happen. And I think the problem that they're going to run into is, uh, who's going to make those movies? Um, so I think people don't, the, the other sort of piece of what you're saying is mm. the talent pipelines. It's not just that, you know, the, you know, Netflix and, uh, you know, PBS, you know, tend to be, have, you know, you know, kind of liberal executives. It is more like all of these film schools and all of these, and, and all of these other, you know, film festivals and talent training cultivation programs you know, the mentorship that you get under great directors, all of it kind of is a pipeline that works very well for liberals to, you know, develop their skills and make better movies. So we're starting to develop conservative alternatives to pipe to the so same sort of pipelines that already that already exist on the other side, which is starting with this film incubator program uh, that we've just launched. And we're now bringing in our first cohort. So we'll have four fantastic filmmakers and we're going to make four very good films with them. And that'll be the first step of what's going to be, you know, a, a network effect, you know, as we start to kind of turn the flywheel and start to demonstrate that this can work on the right as well. Well, the, you, you've put out a lot there and I'm um, very much uh, happy that you guys are doing this. Um, you know, the one, one little tiny point uh, as Michael was talking about the ecosystem uh, which is one way of saying ecosystem, you know, either way, uh, tomato, tomato. But but I was thinking kind of a, you know, wordplay pun, which is the echo system, you know, E-C-H-O. Um, and, and that becomes, you know, something that is uh, reverberating, uh, you know, pun intended, um, within the system. That So there is kind of this um, echo chamber of an echo system. And um, it becomes difficult to hear anything else. And it, it contextually... Um, I think it's structurally impossible in a sense. Um, you know, we have a, a nice little suburban home um, and uh, through the years we've had to have pest control. Um, 
be, you know, because of, I guess when we first got it, there were termites. Um, and then, you know, rodents uh, always want to get in. But, uh, you know, my feeling is that a fair number of these establishments are similar to that. And, and they kind of see um, uh, they have kind of a border control or a pest control to keep conservatives out. And I think it's very difficult to, you know, even imagine that that you can kind of latch on. Uh, you know, to, to put your message, I mean, let's say you wanted to go to uh, any of the top film schools, NYU or USC or something like that, and you had something, uh, an opinion different. Let's say, you know, you're a, an acolyte of Ben Shapiro and you want to put something out. Well, Ben Shapiro himself and Michael Knowles and whatnot, you know, they get shouted down at universities. Um, I went to uh, Yale uh, University and uh, the Buckley Institute, um, you know, famously, uh, have quasi famously, you know, within our milieu, has a, has a disinvitation dinner every year. And uh, this last one I went to uh, had Jordan Peterson there. And it's basically named after the fact that they, they will invite people who have been disinvited, which is a polite term for kicked out of the public sphere um, at the universities. And so, you know, universities, uh, I think, are actually have a kind of an accurate label now in the sense that they are not diverse. Uh, they've gone to universe uh, in the sense of presenting one point of view, which is probably not the original der derivation of the term. Um, you know, so, so you know, it, it's, I, I think, um, hard not to be a little bit uh, disconsolate over it and figure out, you know, maybe there's some other aspect, some other way of, of slicing this up. Um, so so get, getting back to a, a firm question here, uh, you have Palladium Pictures, uh, who's supporting it? Uh, how will your messages get out? And getting back to Created Equal, which I saw a few years ago and I loved, and um, I had not, you know, connected your, um, you know, a name with it when I first saw it come out. And I tried to find it, it was difficult. Um, and I, I saw it got kicked off Amazon when I did find it and track it down and whatnot. And I watched it and I, I recommended my friends and whatnot, but I don't think it's percolated through. You don't certainly don't see, you know, Halloween costumes, uh, you know, with, with uh, you know, Clarence Thomas uh, get-ups, which, I mean, invariably we do almost every uh, Halloween, we see a Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, you know, how, how does one get the kind of cultural echo uh, to happen? Well, well, first of all, I think it's worth reiterating that the, it took the left 60 years to get to this point. They began in the 60s, and, you know, it's been, it's been 60 years later. They were patient. They were careful. I always refer people back to the comments of people in the Frankfurt School in the beginning. They were the they were a, a sort of Marxist think tank that you know came out of Europe and then centered really largely around the New School and other places. And they were the leaders in a way of this idea, this cultural Marxism idea of let's let's uh, take over the institutions. I mean, it goes back to Gramsci, but but they were the they were the leading exponents of it in the '60s. And they were all very depressed about their capacity to take over American institutions. They were, you know, this was they were they were looking at America first in the '50s and early '60s, and they would look at Bonanza and the things on TV, Father Knows Best, and everyone seemed happy. And how are we ever going to convince this happy, contented middle class country to become revolutionary? How are we going to take over? It looked undoable. And Hollywood was controlled by moguls who had left. East fled Eastern Europe and were very patriotic, but they were careful. They were patient. They looked for opportunities. They were very focused, and over time they succeeded. People on the right want to succeed tomorrow, but they don't have this patience. Cultural change takes time. We do not like to promise people that we were going to change things, you know, next year. You have to change can start, and we could show progress, but I, I think it'll take time. I, I do, I, I also like to say, however, about making films, I spent some time in the government. I think it's very hard to change the government. Conservatives are often optimistic about changing the government. There are always, people have often said to me, oh, Michael, don't worry, wait until there's a Republican president. He'll fix the culture. But that has like never happened. There have been many Republican presidents in my life. I remember fix the culture, whatever that means. They can barely fix anything political. The, the, the politics is hard. As we know, there's an administrative state, a permanent bureaucracy, hard to change. It's a, it is not as responsive as it should be to democratic um, pressures. However, 
culture of film is a relatively free market. Conservatives can make films. Conservatives can, can, as Thomas was alluding to, take over distribution systems. They could buy and sell and create new um, streaming services and, and, and everything else. They have simply failed to do it. It takes money and it takes time. Billions of dollars if you actually to actually fix the culture writ large. So we haven't put the time and effort into it, so we can't complain that we're not succeeding. I often say it's not really a culture war. It's not a culture war when only one side is fighting. And only one side is actually making culture. It's as if you had a real war where one side had an army in the field and the other side were complaining about that army. Who would mm -hmm. win? We are just complaining about culture. They're making it and they're serious about creating its institutions and we have not been. So let's see what happens if we change that. The thing, the piece that we are starting, and I think we see the effects almost already, is the thing Thomas was talking to about this incubator that we've launched at Palladium. And I encourage your, your viewers and listeners to apply, actually. Not, it's going to be every year. It's not quite open yet for the next season. It'll be, up, then it'll be a few months, but you can go to the web, palladiumpictures.com website and see when it does open. But we are... We are funding the work of what we think of as young, up and coming, conservative, right of center, non woke, whatever term you want to use, filmmakers with a different perspective. We're going to fund their short film. We're going to give them distribution and help them promote it. But this is what Thomas was saying. More than that, they're going to be part of a community that hopefully will help each other and go on to make bigger and better films. And I am not actually that pessimistic. I have gotten every one of my films nationally broadcast on PBS, including the Kyrus Thomas film, to say nothing of the fact that before it was on PBS, it was in many, many movie theaters. It was in, what is our number? I think 100, some, 110 or something, I forget, theaters before, you know, this, was just, this was in January of 2020, before the pandemic kind of knocked closed movie theaters, and now it's streaming. Now, it's true that Clarence Thomas has not, had, has not achieved the bounce that Ruth Bader Ginsburg does because it's only one film. She has that entire system behind her. For example, the film that was made about her, the best of the two documentaries, was nominated for an Oscar. It was in Sundance. Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself went to Sundance. Uh, uh, and she, was, she appeared... She, Robert Redford, who started Sundance, introduced her and praised her. We were, there's no doubt that he would not give that treatment to Clarence Thomas. But I think we can, we can make a start. We have to try to do it with the seriousness in which they've done it. And I want to emphasize that they're to be credited with getting their ideas out, whatever it is, whether it's about abortion, the environment, history, their version of what happened in the Cold War. We just have to get our version out. It's supposed to be a war of ideas. We are not fighting. It's a complete failure on the part of conservatives. It's not the people on the left are not to blame. They're doing what they're supposed to do, fighting for their ideas. We are not fighting hard enough. So um, I, I, I think you know. We, I think we do fight. Um, I think there's a little bit of uh, tilted table uh, situation. I, I remember when Hillary Clinton got elected to the Senate. Uh, from New York, of all places, and uh, she had a book out, uh, which I'm sure nobody would read. Um, and she got a, a, a an advance of you know round numbers, a million dollars, something like that. Um, because because why? Because I mean, I think there's kind of a, a background regulatory capture aspect to these things. When Hunter Biden, you know, needs money, he puts out paintings, and we go for a hundred thousand dollars each. Uh, are they you know are they accurately valued? At that price, no. Uh, is you know, were Hillary's books going to sell a million dollars? No. Um, this is a, th these are you know payments, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They're payments in kind that I think um, you know signify the kind of circular uh, regulatory capture, hand uh, you know you know hand feeding hand um, aspect that that has uh, kind of perpetuated this you know successful march through the, the institutions. And such as they are, the institutions tend to feed on each other. So when the Obamas, you know, get a, a grant at Netflix, well, I, I think it's a quid pro quo. And then there's quo pro quids going back and forth. And if you use the British term, there are lots of quids uh, passing around <laughs> these pros. Um, and 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 what's up with that? Well, you know, it, it's a difficult thing 
you know, I mean, people without being, you know, putting tinfoil hats and conspiracy ideas, I, I think it's fair to say that if money goes to the Ukraine or something like that, that a lot of it's going to go in the hands of contractors and the contractors are happy about it and they will shuttle the money back. And you can argue about these things with vaccines and any number of, you know, uh, kind of situations which accrue that that have money attached that, uh, you know, the government is not necessarily as, as um, firmly, um, you know, uh, frugal as, as you and I might be with our own cash. And so the money's around, slushes around, sloshes around, and and everyone's kind of happy about it, but it's always seemed to be on the left. You know, they don't want you to be in part of that party. And so the money's going to be tricky um, to get to garner. Uh, so I, I guess I have a question about that. And then the other question would be, you know, um, while I uh, kind of disappear, um, is, you know, what kind of Andrew Craven has brought up, that, that a lot of conservatives, you know, they, they, they zone out from the culture and they kind of work on their, their more conservative concepts such as gaming and whatnot, which has its own economy. No matter how you slice it, there's only a certain amount of things to go around. You have to kind of garner, and you have to succeed um, in, you know, I don't know, World of Warcraft or some other games. And those essentially have a kind of a conservative essence to them. Um, are there other aspects where conservatives go um, to, you know, get their culture and to, to fig figure out their bearings and mind you, a side question would be, how do you guys maintain yours? Well, I agree with you. Of course, the table is slanted. And that there is a lot of this, you know, self-serving aspect to things in these institutions. So, so that's because, and, and a lot of the money that's sloshing around on the left, some of it is money that comes from foundations, corporations, but some of it's from the government in a way that is probably not quite right. However, I think there's actually a lot of money on the right, a lot of money, and, and we are not spending it. We're, for one thing, we're, we're philanthropy, you know, the, the right, the, for, I, hope it, I hope this changes, but, you know, for instance, a lot of conservative philanthropy goes to people's alma maters, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, whatever, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, maybe they're waking up to that during the, pre, after the present crisis, maybe that will change. But, but so we have not been smart about the money that's here. And there are a lot of well-funded conservative institutions. I, I don't say that they're not. And, and, but in the cultural arena, there, there's really, not, you know, there, there is money to be had. But I mean, where would it, as Thomas was saying, you know, what, there's not even necessarily the right kind of products to fund. So I'm not sure that money is the, is the single sticking point. Um, I think we have to build these institutions I think money will follow. If there are great films, money would follow. It, it doesn't change your point, Randy, that there's still a, 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 you know, the table is slanted. It's not really a fair, it's not, not a level ground. It's not really fair. We should try to correct that. But meanwhile, we have to actually start producing culture, which we can do. So I, I, and I have got my films out there, so I think it can be done. Thomas, you're going to do that with the incubator films, right? I think so. I mean, I, it has to be some some of this quick pro quo stuff that you talk about has to be on the margins because otherwise, I mean, that's just that's sort of how markets work. I mean, if 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 it, you know films that are not making a million dollars or getting a million dollars, you know that like uh, if it wasn't at the margins, this would mean it was a wide open market. Uh, but we really do believe, like the the demand, it, like that that problem of money moving in in the wrong way and the tail being slanted, although a serious problem, is much smaller than this problem of both sides not playing. I mm. think. Um, mm. So uh, we we do think that actually, you know, there's a there's an opening here because there's a huge interest in half of America is not getting to see the movies they want to see, and pro America stories. Uh, are more compelling than the sort of grievance study type, types of narratives that we're seeing coming out of Hollywood. Um, so we that so that's right. So we have you know, as as my father's saying, we have this this program with these four filmmakers, um, and uh, and and that's for us the start of it. I think like you know it'll it'll take some time to start developing more and more talent, and we have to be patient. But our plan is right away. To make it so that way as many people as we can can get to see these short films we'll see these short films and hopefully that'll start to kind of turn that flywheel for example to that sort of conservative donor class that is in some ways given up on investing on in films 
because in their minds, maybe mm -hmm. conservatives aren't creative or because in their minds, the table is so slanted that it can't be it can't be done. I think that we have to kind of show, not tell with this type of thing. We have to say, here were some young people that had talent and they started out here and we kind of cultivated that talent. And at the end, here is how, here's an amazing final product and we got it out there and everyone saw it. I think once we start demonstrating that, uh, it'll, it'll start to get people interested in actually fighting a winnable war, which is what this is. You just have to win and get into the, you know, get your film to compete on the free market and it has to be do good. It has to actually be better than some of these left leaning films that have this whole ecosystem behind them. Um, well, that's a good answer. I, I, I was uh, just kind of uh, going through our, literally going through our attic. Uh, we did insulation. Whatnot. So some books came down and, and I have this book for, by Asif Mandelstam, uh, Soviet. And uh, you know, he's kind of got the, uh, he, he grew up at the time of revolution. And he's got the standard uh, story of that time, you know, go to university, uh, become radicalized. Uh, this is kind of not a new story, I guess. And, um, you know, join the, literally join the revolution. Um, uh, you know, he grew up in a, like, like um, you know, Bin Laden and uh, a lot of others. He, he grew up in a, you know, wealthy household, uh, bourgeois, so forth. And, uh, and all well and good. But then the revolution happens and then, you know, he, he kind of still wants to be that that kind of firebrand and his writings uh, wind up frying his butt uh, kind of, you know, the, the, it basically he, he makes a, a satire poem of, of, of Stalin. And uh, I'm not sure that, uh, he, you know, it was all done in Sami's dot. It was all done in, in private quarters and some people got to see it. But when it kind of trickled out that people were talking about it, uh, that was the end of, of us at Mandelstam. And uh, he was he was done away with. Um, not not by helicopter, but you know, similar. And and so there's kind of a, a funny circle and cycle of revolutionaries. Uh, I mean, they a they've been bred in colleges for a long time, uh, which is to your point um, about you know some of the things we see in college, whether people are going to keep supporting colleges. I personally am not uh, supporting my college. I have given money to the Buckley Institute, as mentioned above, um, and I think we have to kind of. Uh, you know, the actual root word of stimulus is, is a thorn. I think we have to stimulate, you know, provide some kind of thorny, um, uh, play, you know, pushback to, to some of the uh, forces that are out there. Um, you know, there is kind of an innately conservative essence to, to, to life. Um, I think we have to live conservatively. Uh, we can't, you know, we have, uh, we don't know what the future brings. We have to kind of save money. We have to, you know, do the things that on our own, you know, we wish maybe the government would do and others would do. Um, how, how do you tap into the conservative essence of, of man uh, and viewers? And and to that point, you know, I, I recently uh, saw well, a year ago, The Sound of Freedom, uh, which was a successful movie and had no promo, no major studio and so forth. And um, how, how, you know, are you able to kind of template that? And what are the other movies out there that, you know, maybe signify uh, similar possibilities for conservatives to, to maybe latch into and or invest in? Well, I, I want to go back to what Thomas was saying. I, I think that, that, you know, a lot of traditional stories are inherently conservative. There is this myth that liberals are more creative and conservatives less creative, and that the real stories are stories of liberal stories of, you know, rebellion against authority. But I point to the, what, the, the, the traditional Hollywood story in, the, in its heyday from the 30s through the 50s, at least, you know, Hollywood itself, it, you know, was made, was created or run by, you know, largely, you know, Jews who fled Eastern and Central Europe, at, you know, who were fleeing, um, a prep, you know, oppression and um, pogroms and came to America and appreciated America. And, and their movies had generally were very pro-American. I'm a big fan of John Ford. And I think John Ford's Westerns, are about a uh, celebrate uh, American values. There's always a dance and, a, and a, often at a church and those institutions, are, it, it, he celebrates the bringing of civilization to the West. It's not, it's not a, a kind of simple story. There are counter trends and other tendencies, but Hollywood has told those stories. You know, it's a wonderful life, the searchers for, for decades and they were hugely popular. They were pro-religion, pro-family, 
So it can be done. People love those movies. Those are the reasons people love those movies all over the world. There were the reasons many people believed in America and wanted to come here. John Wayne was the symbol of America for many people. So there are really stories out there and we have no trouble finding stories from both the past and the current times. I mean, we, you know, we want to tell stories, for instance, about, you know, we, we, we won the Cold War. America and the West won the Cold War. Usually you win a war like that, a, a, a war of many decades, and you celebrate it, or at least you analyze it in a positive way. There are not so many of those stories. You know, it, was, it, took, it took consistent heroic measures, actually by Democrats and Republicans for decades. Where are those stories? And then more recently, there are plenty of stories. I mean, there's a, another way of telling the story, as, as you know, Randy, of the pandemic and what happened during COVID. And, and we know that at least half the country or more is anxious to hear those stories. Critical, for instance, of Dr. Fauci, instead of just a We Heart Dr. Fauci documentary. So there's an audience out there, as Thomas was saying. There are plenty of topics. It's a matter of reaching the audience by coming up with films they actually want to watch and ways to reach them. And I think those are solvable problems. A, a, a first thing, but, but uh, just to underline, we can't just come up with propaganda, which is what the right has tended to do. We can, people don't want to be beaten over the head. They come back after hard days of work. They want to see an entertaining story, not just propaganda, not just kind of intense red meat conservative documentaries. Although many do watch those and they have a place too, but we want to make films that reach the middle of America and not just a conservative core. And there's a huge group out there that are dissatisfied with Hollywood, dissatisfied with woke ideology that are up for other for new things. And there's a huge audience. I mean, and, and many, no problem finding topics. Right. And I just to put kind of a finer point on it, you know, I, I think there's sort of two types of mistakes that conservatives make when trying to make these types of, you know, pro-America films. Uh, the, the first being what you were just talking about, the propaganda film, the sort of like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell a story that is, you know, demonstrates the conservative ideal, uh, right. With something that John Ford would never do. He never. presents America warts and all. I mean, he, he shows the sort of good part of the American dream while also reflecting where and when we fall short and then viewers wrestle with it. And it's like, it's an actual powerful experience. And it's real art. It doesn't feel like propaganda. And that's actually something worthwhile to watch. Uh, the other error, I think, is the quick, just going for a quick hit, mm -hmm. right? Trying to score a political point that is going to work in the short term. Um, I think that uh, it's, for whatever reason, the, you know, the way our market and our ecosystem works kind of is geared toward that. Um, and, you know, so, and, and these types of things don't make a lasting impact on the culture. The culture is a slow burn. I, you know, in our film about Clarence Thomas, you know, you tell this story about him from his perspective. He looks at the camera, tells his life story, and, um, you know, it didn't, you know, our sort of more liberal friends that watched the film, they, I don't believe very many of them really changed their mind about not liking his jurisprudence. But what it did accomplish is they sort of saw him as a human being, which, you know, is what you do when you hear somebody tell their life story over to our yeah. film. And then he got in the news again and they still didn't like him, but now they've seen him as a human being. So that effect, that's a cultural effect. It's hard to pinpoint this, what happened and how that changes the landscape. And it kind of doesn't, you know, if you just do it with just one time, but that's the type of thing you need to be doing. And you can only do that by making a film and putting it on PBS for a liberal audience and making something that's watchable even if you disagree with it. I mean, these are it takes it takes a lot of time to move the the cultural zeitgeist of, of America. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And then and speaking to your movie, I mean, I I, I literally laughed, I cried uh, during uh, creating um, and. Uh, you know, I think it's an incredibly moving story. Um, you know, some some of the actual stories are meta uh, stories in the sense. You know, Brett Kavanaugh probably has a far less interesting, um, you know, origin story than Clarence Thomas does. Um, but uh, you know, the story that's that's writ in a sense. I mean, 
you know, this trial by fire. I mean, Clarence Thomas um, had his, um, you know, Brett Kavanaugh moment um, at, at the hands partly of, of Joe Biden, by the way, uh, which is interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you would draw a parallel to the stories that get writ in the public. And for instance, the Brett Kavanaugh story is a hugely um, po polarizing narrative in a sense. You know, I, I play squash and tennis and I belong to a club and I belong to some other organizations, uh, you know, with, with human beings in them. <laughs> and and uh, such as uh, we have in our leafy uh, Boston suburb, uh, everyone pretty much leans to the left. I mean, it's kind of tricky when you're playing squash lean to the left <laughs> but but they do it anyway and um, and so everyone's already kind of pre-convicted uh brett kavanaugh because that's what they want want to hear and i think a fair amount of knowledge is team-based you know if you're a patriots fan a redskins uh, i'm sorry commanders fan or whatever it happens to be that's the way you see the world and and, and you know you you see the super bowl you know through the lens of of, of uh victor or oppressed you know they stole this from us etc um you know, so when, when a story, which I think is as clear as possible that Christine uh, Blasey Ford um, was blazing a trail of, of prevarication, you know, others don't see it that way. And they, they just they, they, they're re ready to, to follow. And so I think some of the movies get played out in real time. Um, you know, people believe what they want to. I, I was engaging with a, a, a pretty well-known reporter, uh, um, friend of mine, alumnus, um, and uh, he just was totally in on the Trump uh, mocking the uh, 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 reporter with arthrogrippia or something like that. Um, and and there's there's a, a, an actual documentary that debunks the whole thing. He'd never heard of it. Um, these things don't bubble up, but a lot of things are just playing out in real time. We kind of have the movies of our lives um, to sound soap opera-ish. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how, how you feel about that, whether it's been a good, you know, Count Brett Kavanaugh movie. Uh, whether you have another Supreme Court justice movie in you, um, or what are the kind of themes that you're going to be uh, coming up with? Uh, so I'm going to uh, kind of leave that there. You can pick and choose. Well, it, it's true. You know, Brett, the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearing actually followed the Clarence Thomas model amazingly closely. Um, and it actually failed both times on the part of the left since both were confirmed, but they were weakened by the confirmation battle. Um, and it, it's true that, you know, well, I think we will never capture perhaps very progressive people in wealthy Boston suburbs or where we are in a wealthy Maryland suburb. But there's still a vast swatch of the country that is not convinced by these things and needs information and needs to hear the other side of the story. At least half, you know, look at how close the last couple of elections have been. At least half the country. So I, I'm not pessimistic about that and we have no trouble finding stories we are for instance working on a feature documentary about the events in seattle in the summer of 2020 and the george floyd the, during the george floyd protests and you know look there are according to the washington post out of you know there are something like 12 documentaries coming out about january 6 by very prominent documentary filmmakers and they're telling one side of the january 6 story you know the story of and 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 they are it's their right to do that, and I'm sure there'll be good documentaries, actually, and I think there's a lot to be said for the left side of that story. But they don't want to tell the story of the George Floyd riots. I mean, we're going to tell them fairly. We're not going to be, we're not unsympathetic to the protesters, but it's a very complex story, and we will tell all sides in a way that hasn't been done before. So, so you don't hear from you don't hear from the, um, you know, what's the police side of that story? You know, what's the other side of that story? And we will tell it. So there's no, you know, we and we have other topics. We are doing a film about fracking. I mean, and we are going to try to present both sides of that. I, I think fracking has been an amazingly important development in America, you know, since the sort of Obama years, the last 12 or 15 years. America has gone from energy dependent to energy independent. There have been a bunch of documentaries attacking fracking, uh, notably Gasland, which was a very successful one. I think it was nominated for an Oscar or maybe one. Very influential. And, and uh, we are going to look at it from the other side. We're going to profile some people in the fracking industry and look at their how they deal with opposition from environmental groups and regulatory groups. And we'll give that other side, once again, a, a fair hearing. 
but we also want to see the, the fracker's point of view and what they think they're doing and what it means to provide energy for people. So there are a lot of stories like that where Americans have only heard one side. We could, by presenting both sides without slanting it, without it being propaganda, you can get a different kind of picture about what's happened in both the recent past and this, the somewhat distant past. So speaking, you know, kind of the moving target, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, the young people I know, uh, they don't have books on their shelves. Um, I, you know, information filters in, uh, right now it's snowing outside. It's a little bit like that. It's, there's a bunch of stuff like falling down and you can open your mouth and you'll, you'll get a few snowflakes, um, you know, popping in and you lick that, but it's not, it's not you know, of uh, Michael and my day, uh, maybe, you know, three to five, uh, major channels on TV, and everyone kind of knew who Walter Cronkite was. Um, you know, the, we, 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 there's not necessarily the same mainstream of, of the mainstream um, media and whatnot, for better or for, for worse. Um, how are you dealing with kind of the uh, fractionalization, the, the carving up of of the um, of the beast out there? You know, there's an old expression. You know, you don't need a cow all at once. Uh, has to, you know, there's a process. Uh, how, how are you dealing with kind of the different ways that people, um, you know, consume their snowflakes, um, maybe partially being snowflakes themselves, of course, but um, how, how do you uh, deal with that kind of the different modalities that people are not necessarily sitting down for, you know, an hour and 38 minute movie? Well, I mean, people do say that people's attention spans are shorter, but I don't believe that to be, you know, statistically demonstrable. People are watching, binge watching you know, multi-part series on Netflix, including nonfiction ones. So I think people's attention spans, you know, vary. We are doing a variety of different formats, both short documentaries and long documentaries. I think that the fracturing of things does make it harder, but really in the old days, as you say, Randy, when there were three networks and PBS maybe, it was worse for conservatives because the three networks were controlled right. by the left, right. as was PBS. There was no way to get on. You had to beg PBS, which is what we did. Now there are lots of opportunities. Now it's true to influence the public. It takes, as it actually always has, many films, it, not just one. You can't change people's views of Clarence Thomas with one documentary. So the Ruth Bader Ginsburg machine had a couple of documentaries, a feature film, they were out there promoting her in many, many ways, and already the media was sympathetic. So it takes more media, not less, but it can be done. And the fractured media environment is actually an opportunity as much as it's a risk. You, you are nodding, so you obviously agree, Thomas. Yeah, I mean, I do. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the well, the kids these days don't read too, <laughs> which has been around for you know, many generations. Um, I, I mean, maybe the most most interesting time that that take was was present was when kids were reading the absolute most. I'm sure parents are still saying it. You know, why are kids are not reading Pilgrim's Progress the way they used to read it? But you know, there's a, you know an explosion of reading, and I think we're in the same. It's the same type of thing is happening now. We are in an explosion of information, and the the with learning at our fingertips in a way that we haven't had before. And it's it's kind of amazing to see how much kids are hungry for it and how much young people are learning from one another and learning from the internet. It's just done a little differently than before. Uh, in our space, the, the video space, it's really an explosion. I mean, it's like the, the, uh, uh, the ability to get in front of, of people, if you're good, is higher than ever. The fracturing, as you're saying, from this, you know, from, from six channels into find your niche and, and do it online is pretty impressive. Um, and we're seeing, I think Randy mentioned Sound of Freedom, and there's we're seeing things, you know, break past the Hollywood system mm -hmm. in part because, I mean, honestly, the demand for video has exceeded what Hollywood can come out with. And so that, I think, all very much plays in our favor. And it's all very, I mean, but it's but it's all different and it's all interesting. And you have to kind of think through video from a slightly different perspective as the landscape is ch is changing. Uh, my thing that I always come back to, though, is even though we're at this highly winnable situation uh, where, where people are consuming videos and people are thinking in a, a lot of ways critically because of the content that they're taking in and, they're, you know, they, they're, they're looking for alternative sources, even though we're in that amazing spot, we need 
people to actually invest mm -hmm. their time and effort into creating good art that is compelling because that is what's rising to the top in this new fracturing system uh less and less it's going to be what the you know sort of entrenched institutions pick for us to watch all which is good because as we're saying those entrenched institutions are not necessarily always in our favor um so i think it's an exciting time and it's certainly an exciting time it's an exciting time to be making films and so i'm glad we're doing that but it's also an exciting time to be training the future of filmmakers because those people are going to take advantage of a radically different film landscape. So um, I, I appreciate that. And before we, we're kind of rounding out the hour, and I'd like to you know put up a few links so people can find you and your your projects and so forth and learn about the incubator and potentially apply. Um, but I kind of like to ask a you know a movie question, a personal question. Um, <clears throat> what what are your own uh, kind of beacons? Uh, what are the things you know the rules by which you live? And, and how do you, uh, what is a conservative? How do you become conservative? Why be conservative? And what and what are we conserving? Maybe you should start, Thomas. In, in terms of movies in particular, or just in terms of personal philosophy? Uh, I, I would say personal philosophy, because I mean, that, that motivates what you're going to be picking. What, what's your kind of uh, you know, guiding light? Well, I, I mean, I, I think for me, it's like, I, I'm, I just, I feel very much like, uh, you know, I just, I'm in very much in agreement with the American founders, you know, in that mm -hmm. uh, I'm generally distrustful of of too much government power and of, you know, human nature to be corrupting. So I'm like very glad that I like live in a political system in which the people in power are, are meant to be jealous guardians of each other's power. Uh, and that I think and that is a key belief of mine. And I just don't and I see that. Uh, government doesn't ever seem to do anything particularly well. And I think that's a guiding principle. But I think more broadly, I think there's there's much to conserve. Uh, I don't think to me it's not a philosophy of, of applying the break. It's a philosophy of looking critically at, you know, the, the whole, you know, canon of, you know, human culture and taking the great parts about it and learning from it and, and engaging consistently with tradition. Um, so that's what it is for me. That's your guiding philosophy. I'm, I'm, it's hard to beat the founders. I mean, I think that's a, those are they're certainly a touchdown and Lincoln. Um, but on an artistic level, you know, I believe that, you know, uh, one has to sort of think through the whole history of Western culture. Thomas and I are together reading the Emily Wilson's recent translation of the Iliad, perhaps the founding epic in, in Western culture and a great book period oh. and, a, and a complex book, you know, Achilles, he's the hero, but he's not a hero. He's not a hero. Like he's good. And Hector's bad. You know, Hector, the Trojan hero has his complex character with good and bad. And Achilles has a huge amount of bad. I mean, he's the, the whole, the wrath of Achilles causes the murder of people on both sides. And, and Homer is very complex in his presentation of it. You know, war, it's a war book, obviously, but war is presented as a, you know, in both a, a field of honor, but also a horrible, you know, meat grinder as it always is. And so, you know, we, We'll never do anything as good as the Iliad here at Palladium Pictures, uh, we, but it's important to try to understand what made them great and to try to do that. Um, I was very impressed by something I read today about um, uh, what's it, Robin DiAngelo, who wrote White Fragility, was talking about how when she gives an example, when she's talking about the patriarchy, she teaches when she teaches in her class, she uses as an example the Sistine Chapel. And she says, you know, when you know, when you look at, you know, you, you know, the the famous picture of of God and and a man being created, she says, well, it's all just all white men. And as she said, and it's God, and he's and, and with another white man, I don't remember who it is. Maybe it's David. I forget who. <laughs> Clearly, it's Adam. It's often called, you know, God creating Adam. But to not know that that is what is going on there and to be a PhD and to be teaching it, not just happen to be ma making a forget for a moment, but you teach this is amazing. You, you cannot be so foolish without getting a PhD in America. But that 
It's the opposite of what Robin D'Angelo thinks. You have to confront something like the Sistine Chapel and think about why Michelangelo did what he did and not just assume that you're better because you know that, you know, white people bad, you know, people of color good, and he didn't know that. I mean, it's also true that, you know, in Renaissance Italy, he didn't run into many people of color. Uh, and he had a complex picture of gender. I, I you know, he, uh, obviously, he, you know, he's gay, but, you know, he's had this complex picture. I can think you can be critical of it, but you have to sort of understand it. And that that book, that work, The Sistine Chapel, is an amazing confrontation with this sort of history of man and the nature of God and the, na the human condition. And to only see it as white racism and patriarchy seems to me so backward. We really are the other side of that. I think it's a huge sadness. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's it's um, it's self obvious how sad it is. You know, people react. You know, the, 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 you were talking about the founders, and the, you know, the founders. Uh, I think best product is that they understood that that humans, in to borrow the kind of the Christian term, you know, are fallen creatures, and that we um, we have our interests and so forth. And to put those, you know, kind of have a checks and balance system that. Um, people's interests are going to compete against each other. Um, and getting back to the great competition, you know, our gladiator phase, you know, the Super Bowl, uh, which I only just realized the other day, if you put the B the other way, it becomes a superb owl, uh, which is kind of, I think, a, an interesting concept. But um, <laughs> there's a lot at play there. So people will watch the Super Bowl, which in, in essence is a conservative aspect. There are winners and losers. There's drama at play. And I think a lot of what's conservative is not necessarily a... Um, uh, a play-by-play -play movie um, <clears throat> where, you know, which introduces the stock, you know, white man, bad, um, you know, purple haired, uh, nose ring, uh, you know, daughter, great. Um, but, you know, a lot of these things play out. I, I just was um, kind of thinking while you guys were chatting about uh, the Super Bowl, the halftime show, Usher, uh, he, he said, you know, they never thought I would make it. Like, who, who were they? You know, here he is on the stage. He's got, uh, you know, literally a thousand um, uh, dancers around him, or maybe a few hundred. And so, I mean, I, I'm not sure he what the tough times of Usher's life were. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to read up on it. But then I noticed that there was a lot of Bud Light um, sponsoring, and and, and the, here they are at the Super Bowl, and they, they must have decided to, to do a sea change a little bit. And I didn't see uh, Dylan Mulvaney um, up there with Usher or any, anybody else. And they were going for their old kind of you know humorous, uh, jokey demographic. And I think. You know, the, the essence of conservatism, in a sense, is like we just want to be left alone. Uh, Bill Burr, who's not a conservative, but a comedian, uh, not to be confused with Bill Barr, who is a, maybe a comedian, but not a conservative. Um, but uh, uh, Bill Burr, you know, says he just wants to watch the game. Can they can they stop ruining stuff You know, when they when they kneel for this, when they do the flag, when they have all these kind of political overlays, when they're wearing pink? I mean, he says, I'm nothing against, you know, curing breast cancer. I get it. But it's a football game. We just do the football game and, and you do your own thing at, at a different time and so forth. And it's like a lot of conservatives just like stop ruining things. And and I, I guess the hopeful message I would have is that, um, you know, Usher was kind of a, a little bit of a moving the needle back from uh, maybe last year's Super Bowl, which was like one kind of hip hop ish thing after another. Um, and, and Bud Light seemed to have, you know, learned a lesson and they're trying to, you know, regain audience. So I think audience is there. Uh, for these things and kind of the conservative essence messages that we have is, gee, you know, get get the F out of the way. Let us do our thing. Let us have our human passions, our human play, our families, our kids, our marriages, our loves, our competitions, and stop ruining everything. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that'll be uh, a, a movie uh, potentially. So, so last words before I kind of pop up some of your um, uh, some of your stuff. Well, I, I want to say I too am optimistic. I mean. It's always fun to complain about what the left is doing, but I agree with you, Randy. There's a huge, it, a huge audience that wants to see traditional kinds of movies and documentaries, and are tired of being lectured to and by by woke um, apostles. Um, and the key is to make those films and and try to do that and support that. And 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 we. You implore your audience to either apply to our incubator or recommend other young people to do that. We're looking for people, you know, not just right out of film school, but someone who's done maybe one film that is shows some promise that we can 
that's in the early phases of their career and they can go to our website and find out and find out how to apply and if you liked created equal we have 15 or so other films they're also all on our website some of the not not on the palladium website but on our previous our other f documentary film company our previous one manifold productions website so but i i think we need to support new product new talent that's coming out there and i'm very proud of my son who have who have launched this incubator to do just that do you have any final thoughts thomas yeah and also just to jump onto this sort of super bowl thing <laughs> as well as I, resist. I can't help it but well i mean it's a good it's a good example of the same sort of democratization and how that helps us uh because i mean imagine if they did kind of what the nba was doing uh the you know nfl has a lot of you know the people in power pushing their identity politics the nba tried to do because they're they're more sort of entrenched on the left they did they tried to empower the players as well that you know put whatever message you want on your jersey kind of thing you know i think it's important to note if the if the nfl actually talked its talk and allowed for you know identity politics and you know social impact for their players though the the, ba the big you know, stars of, of the NFL are all very much on the right and would be happy to share their religious messages with the world if given the platform. So I don't know if we should say less, you know, have them back off of it. It would be, it's almost fun to let them do it. And I think, you know, sort of same here is that we're, we're doing something very similar. I think we're, we're, we're seeing the landscape shift in the, in the mainstream Hollywood and it's making room for new types of filmmakers. So that was the thing I was going to add to what you're saying is that the type of people that are a fit for our incubator, for example, are it's a vast array of different types of people with different types of backgrounds. So we're very open minded because that is that is they're they're not coming up through all of the same pathways that that left leaning filmmakers come from. So we we got applications this year from people who came from marketing backgrounds that are pivoting into documentary. People who have been making documentaries for conservative organizations that want to go on their own. People in the narrative film industry for a long time that want to, you know, start their own documentary, you know, studio. So there's all sorts of interesting people that are coming together that, that we've seen. And we're really excited about what's going to come out of this. I think it means that we have a more diverse backgrounds among the our people and it's going to be better films. So really this is a good, this, this program is a good opportunity to get your film funded, to get your film distributed. Uh, but I think more, which is, I think are the two things that draw people to us. But the main benefit is they get mentorship from Michael Pack and they get to kind of learn how to make a great film and how to, you know, which they can carry along into the future. Yeah. So let's just, we just want to thank you, Randy, for having us on and um, giving us a chance to sort of make that appeal. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Let me just, uh, before we leave, I want to show a couple links uh, for our audience. And, and if, if Michael Pack's mentorship, um, has resulted in Thomas Pack. I think that certainly uh, commends it somewhat. Um, just a, one quick thing. I, I, I wrote a, a piece uh, for Brownstone, uh, Jeffrey Tucker's site, a Brownstone Institute, uh, uh, Dr. Fauci's own gain of function. I think it's a, you know, it's a, I, I can guarantee you it's a thoroughly researched um, exegesis of Dr. Fauci and a lot of the things that went into the, uh, his take, uh, kind of violating his own precepts of, of uh, public health and so forth. And, um, and whatnot. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, if, if any of you guys wound up doing a Fauci movie, uh, let me know. Um, but uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I have here Palladium Pictures, uh, our work. Uh, there's, uh, I'm not going to click on everything here, but people can go find it at palladiumpictures.com. Um, you have uh, a, a, an interesting article. Uh, you can't fight the culture war without making movies. That's in uh, real clear politics. And I was um, additionally reading uh, a piece of yours in the Washington Examiner, uh, similar, uh, fighting the culture war one documentary at a time. So I commend people to look at these. I'll probably put the links up on YouTube and whatnot. And, um, and people can follow you on Twitter, um, uh, at sign Michael Pack uh, underscore. Maybe, maybe there's another one here. Uh, you let, let us know. And uh, I enjoyed uh, your interviews uh, with Eric Metaxas and um, another Yaley. And I think uh, Bill Barr is a Horace Mann graduate, if I'm not, not mistaken. That's right. Um, and uh, I, I didn't mean to insult him. I actually admire him quite a bit. A uh, hugely intelligent man. And uh, his dad was the um, was the headmaster of uh, Brearley, I believe. 
Dalton. Dalton. Thank you. And I actually have his the dad's book. The dad uh, made this turn from liberalism to conservatism, and it, he, his his book is about that. It's a fascinating mm -hmm. topic, so I, I recommend it. And and one last uh, uh, self plug. So if people want to help support my my podcast video cast, uh, such as it is, they can go uh, buy my book. It's called Overturning Zika. Uh, the pandemic that never was. This is a, I got to tell you, it's a fascinating topic. I never thought I'd write on this. It was not really on my radar. Uh, it wasn't on my, you know, my prediction card in 2016. But in 2019, I, I noticed it had never recurred. I'm like, what's up with that? And I, I started delving. The more I kind of pulled on the, the thread, um, you know, to use the kind of emperor's new clothes analogy, there was uh, really nothing there. Uh, there's no there there, but it has not been rescinded, re, re, yeah, retracted, uh, recanted, reformulated, re anything. And uh, I recommend people buy it. Even better if they read it. But if they buy it, uh, they'll help support me. Uh, that'll be lovely. Um, and uh, and that there you have it. Um, actually, oh, one self promotion. I, I actually have a, a Zika comic book and uh, treatment. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna burden you guys by uh, having you take a look and uh, be fodder for uh, something else. I think it's a fascinating story because it's a kind of a, a little Fabergé egg of a, of a, a pandemic intact. Uh, the COVID one, we're still, I think, a little bit too close to with the vaccine still running around. But the, the, the Zika microcephaly one, we've spent a billion dollars of our own money, U.S. taxpayers and whatnot, uh, for something that's quite illusory. It already disappeared by the time the money got expended. And nobody's, you know, come back and said, what happened? And I think it's a, a really telling story. Had it been more better broadcast prior to the, the current one, uh, people would have had a little bit more skepticism about that and that's a, its own separate story i actually had the editors of jama on a zoom call such as this in early 2020 and they wanted to publish my it was before it was a book it was an article and um and uh, uh dr livingston i presume um he yeah he was the chief medical editor and he said he, he liked it. he found it you know irrefutable what i was saying about it um and he said he would love to publish and i remember feeling yay but he said he wouldn't because it would um, somehow sow doubt on the public health establishment, which is a crucial thing not to do at this time where coronavirus is kind of, you know, lurking around the corner. And I thought, well, what better time? But anyway, so that's how people uh, view things differently. And as long as the, the things get out there, you can have a debate of these things. But conversely, he shut it down. And I think that's what we've seen happen for things like Clarence Thomas via Amazon. Why not? So I'm so happy that you have your voice out there and that you've been forthright about it and showing that Horace Man lion uh, mm -hmm. spirit. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Randy. Thank you. All right. So have a lovely day. And uh, thank you so much for being on my show. Thank you, everyone who uh, carried forth and listened. Okay. Thank you.